My name is Garth Gibson. I am the president and CEO of the Vector Institute for AI. We are one of three uh, pan-Canadian AI uh, institutes uh, with Amy in Edmonton and Mila in Montreal. Uh, today we are uh, going to get a talk on a COVID-19 contact tracing app and its uh, structure uh, and utility for society. Uh, the talk today is being presented uh, by four speakers. It's on COVID, Empowering Citizens Against COVID-19 with an AI-enabled decentralized contact tracing and risk awareness app. Our speakers are Yashua Bengio, the Scientific Director of Mila, and a full professor at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal, a Canadian CIFAR AI Chair, uh, and co-director of the CIFAR Learning in Machines and Brains program, and one of the principal founders of the Pan-Canadian AI uh, strategy, which is, uh, uh, supports all three uh, institutes with uh, CIFAR in a uh, leadership role. We also have uh, Jumana Gosen, the Director of Applied Machine Learning Research at Mila, Richard Janda, the Associate Professor and uh, Associate of, at McGill School of Environment, President and Co-Founder of the Micro Project, um, and uh, Abin, Abinav Sharma, a Cardiologist and Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine, Divisions of Cardiology and Experimental Medicine at McGill. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask Yashua to take over, present your slides. Uh, we uh, will follow up with questions. The questions will come from uh, uh, Brenda McPhail, the Director of Privacy, Technology and Surveillance Project at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, Ashley Tuitt, the Associate Assistant Professor of Epidemiology, Dalalana School of Public Health, University of Toronto, and Nick Feemster, the Neubauer Professor of Computer Science at the University of Chicago, and then we'll go to full questions from the audience, which you should enter into the Q&A session. Yashua, stage is yours. Hi, thanks a lot, Garth, for the introduction. Uh, maybe we can directly go to the next slide. So I'm going to tell you about COVI, which is uh, an application we have designed, uh, bringing together a lot of expertise from many fields, because this is a very, very complex uh, area that we're talking about, how we can use technology from phones, technology from AI in order to um, warn people ahead of time so that they can uh, have a chance to change their behavior in order to fight this uh, horrible disease. So the uh, field of uh, tracing app is something that is uh, booming right now in the world. Many countries are looking at how to use phone technology in order to uh, reduce the transmissions and most of the discussion is centering on a very simple model, which we call the binary tracing, in which a person gets a notification if they were in contact with somebody in the last 14 days uh, who later turned out to be diagnosed positive. So this is interesting. There's a, a lot of studies suggesting that this could actually reduce the reproduction factor of the uh, virus. But there are also lots of questions and issues. For example, the amount of um, uh, uptake that is necessary for, for these techniques to work. Uh, also, the kind of technology that is being used under the hood. Uh, is it going to be accessible? Um, what kind of governance there might be around these kinds of systems to make sure that they don't end up being abused? So uh, at uh, Mila and with our partners, we've been really paying a lot of attention to all of these aspects. And what we're putting forward is a system that goes beyond this binary tracing, yes, no, you've been in contact with somebody who is infected, but can use all kinds of other information that may be available through your phone, in particular from questionnaires that people, information can, that people can provide about their uh, medical conditions, about symptoms they may have, about their behavior, their age, and things like that. And, uh, and also, instead of sending this one bit of information, we are sending risk levels. Um, and these risk levels really make a big difference because they allow to present the users with a dashboard that uh, give them advance warning, even before they get symptoms, that they might be contagious. And then we provide them with recommendations to help them decide how to uh, change their behavior in accordance to public health recommendations. 
The data that the phone is collecting can also be used by public health authorities, for example, by providing advance warning that outbreaks may be coming in different areas. And uh, the AI model that we're building is also an epidemiological model that allows to simulate how things would um, uh, evolve in the future according to different policies that public health may choose. Next slide. And I, I think the next slide is for Jumana. Can you change the slide? Yes. We see here the results of uh, simulations that we ran to compare different approaches to try to control the spread of the disease. The first approach, which is called unmitigated, basically assumes no intervention. People are allowed to continue to live their normal life, interacting with as many people as they used to do uh, prior to the COVID crisis. The second approach called social distancing is one where every person is asked to reduce the number of contacts that they have uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is meant to uh, reduce the spread of the disease. Then we have uh, two different variants of uh, digital binary contact tracing. So this is related to the apps that have been developed in several countries. The user installs the app on, on their phone and the app is going to keep track of the contacts the user had over the last uh, 14 days. And then if the user tests positive, uh, those contacts would be quickly uh, reached out to and recommendations would be provided to them in terms of uh, what to do, for example, to get tested or uh, self-isolate at, uh, at home. Now, uh, those approaches are limited in their effectiveness uh, because with the binary contact tracing, we're reacting a bit too late. We're waiting for the positive test to arrive before reaching out to contacts. But it might be that the contacts of the user who was infected got infected themselves by the user and continued to moving around in society and started spreading the disease. So it's really important to start being proactive uh, early on uh, so that the, uh, the spread of the disease is controlled. And this is what COVID is trying to do. It's trying to send uh, messages to the user himself or herself and to their contacts uh, when the user starts being infectious so that people start taking the necessary uh, precautions. Uh, and we have to remember that uh, uh, an infected person starts being contagious prior to the development of symptoms. So basically, the person doesn't know that they are sick because they have zero symptoms, but they are actually contagious. And given that they don't know that they are sick, they continue to move around and they infect other people. The other thing to keep in mind is that some COVID-19 uh, infected persons uh, are asymptomatic. So those people will not know that they are sick, but they are still contagious and will contribute to, sp to the spread of the disease. Uh, what we see on the right-hand side of the plot is the impact of the, the different approaches on uh, the RT uh, factor. So this, this is the effective uh, reproductive number. It basically uh, represents the average number of individuals who will get infected by a single person. And what we want this number to be is to be lower than one, because this means that one person is infecting on average less than one other individual. And by doing that, we can control and, and stop the spread of the, of the disease. When the simulations we ran, uh, we see that with COVID, we're capable of going beyond the, a value of one, which is basically what we're looking for. The next slide. So there was a recent uh, study published by a team at Oxford University where they tried to uh, measure the impact of digital contact tracing uh, on the spread of the disease. They did large scale simulations uh, using an epidemiological model that was tailored to the UK population. And they came out with uh, several conclusions, including some of those listed here. So they, they've noticed that if 56% of the total population uses a digital contact tracing app, so this is equivalent to about 80% of uh, app adoption, it is possible to suppress the uh, epidemic in the sense that we can, uh, we can control the, the spread of, uh, of the virus. Now, if the adoption rate goes down, their simulations show that it will be important to go back to periodic lockdowns. The higher the adoption rate, the, uh, the larger the, 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 the intervals between lockdowns. Uh, the other thing they noticed with digital contact tracing is that even if uh, it is possible to stop the spread of the disease, and this is again under some optimistic assumptions, we still 
ask a lot of people to self-isolate, even though a large amount of those people are not infected. And therefore, we're preventing people from being able to continue their life, going to their job, when in fact they are not, uh, they are not sick. And in their case, it was millions of people. Yeah, the simulation, yes, was also very large. Uh, Abhinav? So thank you very much, uh, Yumana. So um, there are a number of key benefits for public health that really should be um, highlighted with the utilization of risk awareness, or risk tracking. So the first is because uh, the application enables us to automatically inform users to self-isolate, and if they get symptomatic to get tested, this has the potential to rapidly diminish epidemiologic spread of, um, of COVID-19. As Yumana mentioned, one of the big challenges with this particular virus is that a lot of the spread happens in the pre-symptomatic population. So those individuals who have acquired the disease, who are um, pre-symptomatic, they haven't developed symptoms, but they are still contagious. Uh, modeling analyses have shown that 40 up to 50 and even 60% of the community level spread is happening with these individuals. And so by identifying individuals up front who may be at high risk of having COVID-19 based on their exposures to other individuals who may have had COVID-19, um, this will allow for uh, quick and efficient, and efficient um, epidemiologic suppression. Now, the other very important thing is that this can reduce the overall number of cases and produce early warning signs within cities. This is done because, um, like was previously mentioned, we are tracking risk. So we can identify if in various neighborhoods or various regions, the risk levels start to go up. This risk level rising will precede the increase in case counts, which may only happen seven to 14 days later. So if there's a local outbreak occurring within various regions or neighborhoods, localized and targeted public health interventions can be employed, such as doing more screening in that area, such as maybe shutting down or closing some schools in that area. So this would allow um, the rest of the, the city or the rest of the regions to continue and only have a more focused targeted intervention so that we don't completely shut down uh, cities or large regions. We can of course also define new epidemiologic parameters. So we know for example, that the distance and duration of an interaction have a significant role on the risk of transmission, but we don't actually know how to quantify that risk. It's often assumed that individuals who are uh, less than six feet and for more than 10 minutes uh, are, at good, are at high risk of transmission. But what happens if you're at 10 feet for five minutes? or at five feet for 15 minutes. Like how do these different factors influence uh, the risk of transmission? And in fact, this is actually very difficult to get using standard epidemiologic uh, methods. Um, often these rely on recalling or asking individuals who are infected, tell us about your contacts. And this of course produces a lot of recall bias and gives us imprecise estimates. So this particular strategy enables us to actually define new epidemiologic parameters which can then be used to then run simulations and predict the impact of deconfinement scenarios. Um, more conservative deconfinement, more um, open deconfinement models can be, um, can be simulated to determine what is the population level spread. And so COVID can also help to be a part of the safe return to work strategy or one part of it. Um, COVID doesn't aim to replace public health or doesn't aim to replace local institutional policies but aims to be a part of the solution to help reduce the spread. If there's very high uptake within an institution, if someone gets infected, then those individuals who have been in contact with the infected person can be rapidly identified and can be encouraged to isolate. Of course, all of the recommendations are voluntary and, um, and so we're not gonna force anyone to, to, to take action, but these recommendations uh, are derived in a way to allow individuals to make choices so that they can reduce the spread of the virus. And we can move on to the next slide. So I would, like you, I would like to walk you through a hypothetical example of a person named Jim um, through three scenarios. So the first is when we have manual tracing only, essentially what's happening now with public health. So Jim on Wednesday, uh, and so this is on the top line there, on Wednesday has a high risk contact with someone at a grocery store. He's standing next to someone for a long period of time. And then several days later, this particular stranger starts to develop symptoms and uh, eventually goes on to get tested and is diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, Jim may have now had this high-risk exposure. He would never know, actually, that he's been exposed and he may go into his workplace environment and spread the illness. If there is even some way for uh, Jim to be notified by public health, this may only happen approximately one week to 10 to even 14 days later. 
And so you can imagine the challenge in trying to suppress a virus where Jim may have already been infected and is spreading this to the community. Now, if we look at binary tracing applications, we see if both individuals have the application, if Jim has a high risk contact, if this particular uh, contact then eventually goes on to get tested, Jim will get notified at that point in time. This may still be around a week later. Jim, going through his pre-symptomatic phase, may have already spread the virus to a number of people who will continue to spread it to others. Now let's take a look at the COVID application. And this is the strength of the risk modeling that we we're gonna be using. So Jim downloads the application on Monday. He goes to the grocery store on Wednesday and has this high risk contact. Several days later, this, this uh, individual starts to develop symptoms and enters, the app and enters this on the COVID application. Now this person's risk for COVID-19 will go up based on the symptoms he's entering. And um, because this risk is propagated to Jim, Jim's risk level will also start to rise. Based on the algorithms, Jim will now start to receive increased frequency of messaging to consider to socially isolate or to avoid crowded places or to avoid public transportation. So that by the time the stranger who has now been diagnosed with COVID-19 a week later, Jim is already taking precautions and already taking actions to prevent the spread uh, of uh, COVID-19 in the community. So this could allow for much earlier action and uh, to, to help prevent the spread of the virus. We can move to the next slide. I'll just briefly walk through some of the screenshots of the application. We could see um, it's a very simple um, uh, onboarding process in which individuals download it. It's of course available in both Fre uh, French and English. The rationale for the application is presented along with information about uh, the consent process. Next slide. So uh, individuals have the option of entering some personal health information, although this is not necessary to use the application. So we ask it questions such as, have there been any changes in your particular health status in the past 14 days? Do you have new symptoms? Have you been tested for COVID-19? In addition, to help inform some of the machine learning models, we ask questions such as age, biologic sex, uh, household, and some other variables that have been identified in the literature as being very prognostic for outcomes and for risk of transmission. Similarly, we ask um, for a self-assessment tool. So if individual self-assessment changes, they can at any time enter in these particular symptoms uh, depending on what they're feeling. We prompt individuals um, infrequently um, to, uh, to get them to um, update their symptoms, but this can be done more regularly if the user uh, wishes to. Next slide. And then finally, this all translates into this daily dashboard where the primary recommendations will be given. This will be updated at a regular interval. And you could see, for example, on the right side, um, the recommendation to stay at home, wash your hands and social distance for someone who now may have had an increasing level of risk based on their encounters. The, um, the, the subsequent screenshot shows um, when you've had a very high risk encounter, now your risk level is so high that you should really isolate and call your doctor for further instructions. So this sort of graded messaging that's delivered to individuals allows them to take behavioral changes to help prevent the spread of the virus in a voluntary manner. So now I'm gonna hand uh, the baton off to Richard to talk about some of the privacy implications. Thanks so much, uh, Abhinav. When we began this project on March 23rd, uh, all of us agreed that we had to flatten two curves. Uh, we had to flatten the R curve that Yashua, Jumana, and Abhinav have spoken to, but also at the same time, flatten the curve on possible authoritarian interventions. We'd seen what had happened in China and elsewhere and asked whether our democratic society could do at least as well or even better uh, consistent with our principles. Uh, we began working really at the outset with uh, a, a group of people who were focused on privacy protection, including, I must say, Daphne Polito, William Yu uh, from the University of Toronto, uh, they'd written a paper about using mix nets to protect privacy on contact tracing apps. And we thought, let's see if we can bring that into the mix from the beginning. Pardon the pun. Uh, we worked as well from the outset with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, with, the, uh, with parallel uh, commissioners across the country, and indeed with the uh, uh, Commission on Ethics and Science um, in Quebec uh, to hold ourselves accountable to how these uh, techniques we were developing would work um, in the world. And indeed, we, we reached out as well to, to colleagues uh, who would give us independent assessment, uh, uh, colleagues uh, at Obvia it, in uh, Quebec, which is uh, an observatory on ethics and artificial intelligence, a team led by 
uh, Florian Kirschbaum at the University of Waterloo in Calgary, another team led by Jason Miller at the University of Ottawa, all for their uh, independent assessments and critiques, not for their endorsement, but we've certainly benefited uh, from uh, what they have uh, brought to bear on our early white paper uh, drafts. We knew that we could not achieve uh, levels of trust among Canadians uh, without privacy protection. And so this has been really something that has uh, driven the project uh, from the outset. In general terms, the privacy challenge, I think, can be divided into two. Uh, there's big brother surveillance, which in essence means that uh, data can fall, uh, might fall into the hands of a rogue authority, whether state or private. But there's also what can be called little brother surveillance, which means that users can figure out who is at the origin of changing risk for them and engage in shunning uh, or worse. Uh, we believe we have a rigorous approach uh, to both species of problem, which we're happy to discuss further in the, in the question period. Um, although we also have to acknowledge that ha hacking and cybersecurity risks remain, we've identified them in, in our white paper and we've sought for this reason a security audit and advice uh, from BlackBerry. In summary, our approach uh, is as follows. We have sought to decentralize uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis the, the sharing of changed risk status. Uh, and uh, we, we've protected uh, that exchange through a mixnet a series of servers that shuffle the encrypted addresses uh, that contain contact keys and thus make the reconstitution of the data set uh, computationally prohibited. Data is purged as its usefulness expires and the entire machine learning data set uh, will be destroyed when the pandemic is declared over. We have an independently uh, governed data trust in the Covey Canada not-for-profit and I'm delighted that we can say that we've uh, succeeded in getting uh, Louise Arbour, uh, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, to be our honorary chair and Louise Atis, uh, a former judge of the Court of Appeal of Quebec uh, to chair the board. We'll have an ethics committee overseeing this with uh, stakeholder representation, an ombudsman function for users, uh, open source with copyleft license, and of course the publication of all of the decision making that happens through this uh, governance structure. There will be ongoing ethics, uh, privacy, and algorithmic audits. In the end, what we're seeking to do is earn the trust of citizens so they will be willing to alert others as to the changes in their own risk levels. And as we learn machine learning, uh, as we use machine learning rather, to uh, gain a greater understanding of the disease. Uh, according to a survey produced by Senator Deakin uh, of the Canadian Senate, 80% of Canadians would be willing to participate uh, in such a process, provided of course that we can show them that what we're doing uh, earns their trust. And that's what we're uh, achieving, we believe, with the governance structure we have in place. I think we're done. Ah, excellent. All right, then I will uh, turn to, yes, the sign says you're done, thank you. I will turn to the discussants and start with uh, Brenda McPhail. Uh, Brenda, would you please lead with a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate being included and through me, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association appreciates being included in this incredibly important conversation because making space to raise principled concerns about these kinds of tools that are being developed in this incredibly difficult space where the rights to privacy and equality and life fundamentally interact is so important and people deserve the tools that support their health and protect their rights at the same time. So here's a scenario that I worry about a lot. If the message on my app essentially warns me that my risk is such that I am a danger to others and I need to stay home, whether or not that message empowers me or terrifies me is a function of my privilege in society. As a white collar worker with a great boss who can easily work from home and keep pulling a paycheck, I, can, I might feel empowered based on my app's analysis to say I need to stay home to keep other people safe. If I get that message as a frontline worker in a time of massive unemployment where I'm easily replaced, um, keeping in mind that the people who are working on the front lines are often um, marginalized or vulnerable in various ways, it's not going to matter to me how carefully that message is worded it's going to be terrifying. It's gonna cause a serious stressful quandary for me, unless there's a social support system in place 
external to the app that protects my job and my income. Um, and we should be clear that the kind of people who are most likely to repeatedly get those kinds of stressful warning messages um, are those frontline vulnerable people because the criteria that are presumably going to influence risk, like location of residence in a quasi congregate setting, the amount of traveling they have to do, the time they spend in crowded locations are consistently going to apply to those people. Um, so then the question is, and, and what's been missing from the public conversations about automated or digitally facilitated contact tracing in general is the potential need for legal intervention and social policy that wraps the app. And you referred to in your white paper to that several times. You've, you've acknowledged that in your, in your planning. So my question is in your assessment, what are the legal and social supports that are needed for your application to work as you hope that it will? And what are the risks to people in Canada if the app rolls out with first having those supports in place? I think I'm going to let Richard answer, but uh, first I want to mention that all of the things that you're talking about already exist whether we use an app or not, simply because people will get symptoms and they will suspect that they might be infected. And then we, we have all of the same problems. Uh, but we are totally agreeing on uh, what you're trying to say, that we need the social governmental supported infrastructure to deal with the, the, the difficult issues you raised. Uh, I don't know, Richard, if you want to add more. Brenda, thank you so much for that. And, and I have to say that uh, the question you raise is, is also keeping me up at night. Um, we, um, uh, we have done some work in this regard and uh, frankly, we'd be, we'd be very grateful for your, your uh, advice and, and, and further suggestions. We've, uh, we've been reaching out, of course, to uh, the Quebec Human Rights Commission to, uh, to a range of groups that uh, are worried about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, vulnerability being exacerbated by certain kinds of, uh, of recommendations uh, being received. We, we want uh, as well to be keeping track ourselves of how representative the population is. There's another kind of problem Represent how representative the population on the app is because we might find privilege embedded as well in who has these fancy uh, smartphones and who can't have access to uh, to this kind of tracing. And we have some thoughts, some strategies on on that front as well. But you're absolutely right that that uh, you know we can almost fetishize the technology. We can say let's let's build this very exciting and and uh, uh, high performance tool, uh, but if we don't place it in contexts of social um, response and legal response, um, we, we might not have, uh, you know, adequate levels of protection. Suffice it to say, as I hope you can appreciate that, uh, you know, we have, we have limited leverage ourselves on those questions. Uh, we certainly have been alerting uh, governments uh, and, and, and officials as we've been speaking to them to these concerns. But uh, to make sure that, that we have the right mechanisms in place will take certainly much more than the the combined brain power, uh, uh, you know, in the COVID, in the COVID team, uh, and and as I say, we'd be we'd be most grateful to you for your thoughts as to how we can advance that agenda. Um, Do you have a follow-on, Brenda? Yeah, the second question is is slightly linked. A common concern about and and sometimes a claim of proponents of machine learning applications that interact with human behaviors is that the insights allow more nuanced interventions into human behavior. Um, in the white paper, you seem to plan to target messaging based on individual characteristics to some extent and collect information about how people respond to prompts and recommendations in order to fine tune them. Um, but also, also, thankfully, I'm, uh, uh, I'm grateful for it, spent a lot of time talking about the fact that your goal is empowerment rather than behavioral manipulation and the ethical necessity of walking that line. Um, so what if any forms of external accountability are you going to put in place to ensure that that really difficult balance is achieved and maintained over time, particularly in the face of potential pressure to move from advising to nudging to controlling, which realistically might come either from governments or even from the public as, as the course of this pandemic moves on. I'll take it. I'll take a, a, a try at that, if I may. Um, I'd like to believe, and I, th I think I can believe, that uh, Louise Arbour, who is, of course, one of Canada's uh, leading 
thinkers on on questions of uh, of human rights, uh, you know, domestically and internationally, um, was was attracted to work on the project uh, in in significant degree because these were questions that we we cared about and wanted further further assistance on. Um, the whole effort is to produce a civic gesture. The whole effort is to take us away from the thought that we are sort of under control and under surveillance and put in the hands of citizens the capacity to act together on this, to be empowered to act together on this for, the, for their own sake, for the sake of their neighbors, for the sake of, uh, of others in society. It has to take on that form. It has to become, dare I say, a kind of social movement. And it won't be a social movement. It won't have that legitimacy unless exactly the, the questions you're asking, Brenda, can be, uh, can be addressed adequately. So we will, of course, have, uh, as I tried to set up very briefly, uh, uh, an ethics advisory panel with uh, people perhaps like you <laughs> uh, sitting there uh, and, and, and overseeing you know, how, how, in fact, are we managing those questions. Uh, some of those, some of those uh, matters, as, as you say yourself, are, are, are unpredictable. Um, as the machine learning gains in, in capacity, um, how will it interact with the various recommendations so as to produce empowerment uh, rather than um, uh, a sense of, of, of coming under what uh, Cass Sunstein called uh, uh, liberal paternalism? We're not, we're not interested in that form of nudging. Uh, so so uh, I have to say we've been working with the, the Decision Lab, a fantastic group of people who are focused on these questions. And, and that's been their message as well from the beginning. Let's ensure that whatever messaging takes place empowers. Last thing I'll say is that we've also been working with a group uh, uh, of uh, uh, patient advocates who want to ensure that the, 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 the recommendations that are sent out empower patients, are focused on wellness, uh, and we want to run anything that comes through the app through that kind of audit as well. And I'd like to add something uh, maybe we said very quickly, uh, but I think it, it's worth emphasizing. In many other countries, or even in Canada, there's been a number, or there are a number of proposals for different tracing apps. And in all of these cases that I, I'm aware of, the organization that is managing these apps is either the government or a uh, agency of the government, like public health, or a company that has built the app. What we're proposing is different. What we're proposing is an organization that would be independent of government, but of course would have elected representatives on the board because you know we're in a democracy, but they wouldn't control it. There would be experts, but there would be civil society, there would be representatives of the public, and all of their decisions would be transparent um, so that the media and other parties can criticize and can, you know, help steer the discussion, which is very difficult, as you've been saying. Thank you. So let's move on. Um, Ashley, uh, you're up. All right, thank you. Thank you for including me in this conversation. Um, Brenda articulated much, much better than I could my, my major question or point of clarification around sort of you know, how people use this information to change their behavior and whether or not they're, they, they have, you know, they're in a position to be able to react to the information that they receive. Um, I guess I the, the one question or area that I'd love to hear a little bit more about is, you know, there there's, appears to be a lot of functionality within this app, more so than most of the other digital contact tracing apps that I've heard about. Yeah. And, you know, it sounds like a lot of this is really, really relates to this daily risk score and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, this targeted risk messaging and, and you know, how do you, you know, if you're, if you're using this to try and sort of modulate people's behavior um, and, and, you know, their, their, their sort of movements and, and, you know, their, whatever, what basically, you know, their, I guess their behavior essentially, do you have, um, <laughs> like, how, how are you planning to validate this or, or, you know, understand, you know, how much messaging is too much or if you're too sensitive in terms of, you know, if, if I'm getting a message every day that tells me I should stay home for the next two months, you, you know, how are you validating this against data and making sure that people who are receiving these messages 
are receiving the appropriate information to guide their behaviors. Maybe Abhinav, you should take this one. Sure. Uh, no, that's a really great question. Um, so the first is that we, we are working closely with public health authorities um, in some of the recommendations that we're giving. And a lot of the recommendations are already there and they're aligned with, uh, with Health Canada. They're up on their website. It's just a matter of tailoring it to the individual and tailoring those recommendations to the individual based on their risk level. Uh, like you said, we don't want to freak people out or, or, or make people uh, upset or worried, but to give them individualized, personalized, targeted recommendations would really help to um, make, give individuals the power to make the decisions as to what they should do. And these recommendations are drawn on uh, evidence-based recommendations uh, in the literature and through Canadian governmental agencies. And, and I would like to add a little technical thing, which is um, because those messages are coming through the app uh, and they, they can be updated every day by you know, uh, public health, and they could be tailored to different areas, right? So the messages uh, may be different in different areas if public health decides to go, you know, uh, encourage people to self-isolate more in some area where there's an outbreak, as we were talking about earlier, they could do that with this tool, right? It, it allows public health to direct the messaging, uh, not just in terms of the risk level, but also other factors, age, uh, location, and things like this. And, and to highlight some of the things uh, you were mentioning about how much messaging is too much messaging, uh, we have a, a behavioral team um, that's really focused on these exact questions that you're talking about. Um, what degree of messaging does it take before people stop interacting with the application? Um, what level of, of you know, alerts do people start to get fatigued? So we have a huge team that's just dedicated to, uh, that has a lot of experience with app-based app uh, interactions and, and they're working uh, with us uh, on this platform. Ashley, would you follow up? Sure, if I could do a quick follow up. Um, sort of extending this idea of, of, of sort of disparities, um, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, potentially having high, highly localized responses. And I'm wondering how that would work in terms of, you know, thinking about, I think over the past week or so, we've seen a lot more sort of geospatial information in terms of where are, where people are are getting infected in neighborhoods with, with higher disease burden than other neighborhoods. And a lot of those neighborhoods are low income neighborhoods and not necessarily that people are getting infected there, but it's because those are the people who are riding on transit and who are essential workers and are, you know, higher risk of infection. I'm wondering, you know, sort of thinking beyond the individual and more about the neighborhood level impacts of, of, of these sort of highly localized interventions. And if you've been thinking about how, how you negotiate that. I'll jump in on that if I if I may. Um, you know, Montreal uh, sadly has been uh, uh, an illustration of exactly what you've been saying, Ashley. Uh, you know, the Montreal Nord uh, neighborhood, uh, one of the lowest income neighborhoods uh, um, in in Montreal, and and has been uh, really a center of, of the outbreak. And um, in part because racialized uh, workers have been uh, the ones uh, in these uh, nursing home contexts and 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 have born the brunt of, uh, of this. It's, it's given rise to, to a huge social debate in, in, in Quebec. Uh, I see that it's starting to happen in Ontario as well around, around nursing homes. And, and we realize that it's really back to, in a way to Brenda's question, that, that we, we need a whole set of social supports around this much beyond the, the app itself. However, um, I think that there's potential for the app to help inform the social debate. Uh, to help in, to highlight these these points, uh, and and indeed, if we can be working together with representatives of, of uh, uh, you know the, the the communities that are affected, uh, and and give them the information to highlight the social problem, we, the app won't solve it on its own, but the app can be a, a reasonable catalyst uh, for the for the kind of change that's needed. Yeah, and and in general, the potential of an app that collects this kind of data is to allow society and individuals both to take better decisions using data, using reason, because this is, you know, these, these machine learning models, they're basically rational to the extent that they can be. Um, so I, I think we need to move politics towards more of the, you know, science-based decision-making, evidence-based decision-making, 
And this is one of the tools that could help us in this direction. All right, thank you, Ashley. Um, uh, Nick, uh, you're up. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the to the Vector Institute and, and Garth and everybody for having me. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, hearing your presentation and, and reading the white paper as well. Thanks. It was a, a thorough, interesting read. I think I have too many questions for the limited time, so I'll, I'll try to focus on some that haven't been raised by other, other um, uh, panelists so far. Uh, one, I, I thought uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about decisions you made with regards to the system design, in particular decisions about centralization of data collection. Um, I was interested in, in what you had to say there in, in, in your white paper, in, in there being trade-offs between the ability to send certain types of risk messages versus uh, you know, the need to centralize uh, uh, data. Anytime I, anytime I sort of uh, think about centralization uh, as a systems person and as a security and privacy person, I think about risks associated with um, everything from fault tolerance to uh, misappropriation of, of the data. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about about both the systems robustness aspects, but also the risks uh, that centralization might pose to misappropriation or misuse of the data. You talk, for example, in the white paper about grocery stores and retailers potentially misusing the data. And uh, it seems that the centralization decisions you made might raise some of those uh, risks further than a decentralized app would. But of course, there are benefits that you're getting through the risk messaging. Uh, functionality. So uh, could you talk a little bit more about your decisions uh, with regard to centralization? What kind of risks, uh, you know, are, are most acute in the particular design that you've, you've chosen and, and which ones, you know, uh, tend to be mitigated regardless of the decisions of, of how, you've, how you've centralized certain things? So I'm going to start and I'm sure Richard will add things. Um, so as Richard said, we, 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 we're there's a trade-off between the big brother attacks and, and, and the little brother attacks. And, and our system has some centralized aspects and some decentralized aspects. To be more clear, what is decentralized is the communication between phones, uh, although it uses uh, these mixnet servers to make sure that the messages themselves uh, you know, cannot be traced to the source. And we go to pains to make it hard for uh, uh, a, a little brother attack to identify where the message comes from, for example, by shuffling the messages across uh, a given day. Uh, but, but as we say in the white paper, there's always a uh, possibility, say, for a like, organization like a hotel to, who, who knows the person's identity and can uh, cheat in some sense by trying to record the, the signals that their phone is sending. Um, so about the little brother attacks in general, we think that they're inherent to any decentralized system and uh, the solutions to the, you know, for the most part are gonna be around social norms. What, what do we allow people to do? Um, uh, you know, is it legal to fake uh, an app in order to collect risk levels from others? Obviously it shouldn't. And I think our current laws probably handle that, but we need to make sure that this is going to be done properly. Now, regarding the centralized aspect, of course, uh, for various reasons, it's an almost necessary condition for having the, for training the predictor that computes the risk. The risks are computed on the phones themselves. And only the people who are willing to share uh, their pseudonymized data to the central server for training the predictor uh, uh, you know, in a way, take an extra privacy risk by allowing their data to be there. We've also went to a great lengths to try to reduce the chances of re-identification, which is always possible for any uh, centrally uh, uh, stored data set. Um, of course, we already have these risks uh, if, if you consider a database in a hospital, for example. So we, we think that we can protect these kinds of uh, uh, database in the same way that we're protecting uh, these, these other uh, central data sets. And uh, we've tried to make the communication between the phones and the central server done in a way that again, uh, minimizes a lot, of the, a lot of the privacy risk. So for example, again, the, 
the central server, when it gets a packet of information from one of the phones, doesn't know which phone it comes from. Um, and we send separate packets uh, for the information that is uh, like about the medical questionnaire on one hand and about the uh, uh, location related information. So what kind of risks are present in different areas? Because they, it can, I mean, we can still achieve our goals. So the location part is gonna be very coarse, like neighborhood level and is, is used to help public health know what is going on in different neighborhoods. And the uh, medical questionnaire part is used to train the predictor. And since we found that we can separate that information, uh, we did it because it reduces the chances that somebody would use, uh, say, knowledge about where a person lives to help them figure out, you know, if there was a leak of the data, uh, which record may belong to which person. Uh, the only thing I would add to that uh, very complete answer, Nick, is um, that, uh, of course, you could, you could ask the question, um, why... Uh, gather more information uh, through this uh, uh, machine learning methodology uh, than you know other methodologies that don't require that information to be gathered. I, I hope you can see the answer to that question is really the public health answer that uh, was uh, laid out uh, by Jumana. Uh, and of course, uh, Canadian privacy legislation including PIPEDA, which, uh, which we've uh, chosen to come under even though we're not a private Company, we've we've extended the application of Pipita to uh, to this uh, uh, to this app. Um, uh, re requires that we identify the purpose for which data is being collected and give cons give a user the opportunity to consent to that uh, to that data being gathered. Um, the the purpose we believe is 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 very clear. It's about saving lives. Uh, it's about uh, getting. Uh, information back to users about when uh, risk levels have changed uh, even before they have a positive test result. If you're going to do that, as, as Joshua says, um, you need to have uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pr predictor and similar their algorithms trained. Um, and, and we will, uh, we, we had an interesting conversation about this, this the other day where uh, Joshua was kind of wistful about how rigorous this is going to have to be, that we're going to have more than one person in the room making sure that the data can't be, be, be misused. Uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a tough and, and rigorous protocol for access to that, uh, to that server. Um, and of course, it will be uh, uh, state-of-the-art with respect to cybersecurity. Um, but yes, there is that server. That server is part of the, of the uh, uh, the use case for the for the app, and and we think we've we've justified it, and uh, we think we've we've given it the the necessary uh, sets of protection. Okay, Nick, do you have a follow up? We're running out of time, so I, we need to be brief. I know we're very very short on time, so I'll keep a follow up uh, brief. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, some of the the kinds of attacks uh, on risk messaging. Um, particular to, to data harvesting uh, or, or privacy risks. But I'm interested also in, in the potential security risks. Um, uh, let, let me just present quickly a scenario. Uh, maybe I have, uh, a, you know, maybe my app indicates that I am infected. Uh, as an attacker, I could now roam through different neighborhoods and cause a, a bunch of contacts uh, to, be, uh, to be initiated thereby perhaps shutting down an entire neighborhood. Is that, is that something that um, is, is a real threat or is there a way to mitigate that? Okay, so the first way to mitigate that is to make sure that the person is really infected. Uh, and uh, so the um, uh, test results uh, would have to be validated by local or regional public health. And this is the signal that is the strongest. Now, somebody could be really infected and still uh, somehow want to hurt others by, by uh, sending them, uh, by getting closer to them. And in a way, so there are two cases here I want to think about. So one is they, they, they would generally spend time with someone else in, in a sense that would be like, if I know I'm infected and I spend time with someone else, with the purpose that they you know, get a signal, that also means the purpose of infecting them. 
And, and I think uh, from a legal point of view, this wouldn't be considered uh, acceptable. Uh, they could also cheat. So I've seen scenarios where they could cheat, like, you know, take my phone and I wouldn't actually infect the other person, but I would put my phone near someone else. Um, and so again, even though in that case, the, the, the legal problem isn't uh, that they're trying to infect the other person, but they're trying to make the other person's behavior uh, change. Um, and again, I, I don't think there are defenses against these kinds of attacks, except legal and social norms. Uh, we have to make clear that this is a fraud. And in society, there are so many ways that people can uh, attack or hurt each other. And unfortunately, when we bring in these kinds of tools, we bring in more. Um, and that's, that's true of any tracing apps, basically. It seems like one of the, the additional risks, though, is that there's no accountability. So because of the anonymity, I could have an app that indicates I'm high risk and then I basically just go carpet bomb a neighborhood and there's no way for you to figure out that it was me who did that. Well, remember you have to spend something like 15 minutes uh, with a person to register something um, on their phone. So you, you couldn't carpet bomb a whole neighborhood. Um, you would have to, I think it would work if you're targeting a person or a family or a small number of persons. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I got to cut you off, Nick, because we're down to uh, under 10 minutes and we haven't really gone to very much in the way of uh, uh, questions from the audience in general. And there are a bunch of them. And thank you, Abhinav, for dumping in and answering some of those. There are a lot of questions that people have asked. Um, I would like to start off with uh, a very simple, uh, you know, computer science uh, uh, software engineering question. Code has bugs. You will not have no bugs. They're much faster when you're trying to develop a lot of code quickly. There's a lot more of them. It's hard to stamp out. Models are, uh, are kind of a hidden code, developing risk assessments, but not developing them in a way that they generate very bad answers that you can crash a system and notice it's crashed. They just give you possibly the wrong answer. Those answers are driving behavioral changes on people those people are, ha are, are changing and, and they possibly are living or possibly are dying. And you're, if you're lucky in keeping all of your records in a few months, be able to go back and look at the effect you had on society. What are you doing to cope with uh, the risk of bugs in your code directly and in your models hurting people? Get help from as many people as possible to check that code. <laughs> Uh, so we've already had uh, huge help from BlackBerry, who has been auditing our code from a security point of view. Um, they haven't audited the machine learning part. So the machine learning part, I, I, I grant you, is tricky. Um, but what we have a, is a way of checking before we deliver deploy is, a, is an epidemiological simulator. I didn't really have a lot of time to talk about it. But we've built a... Uh, an, individual based uh, uh, model that is it's a it's an epidemiological model where we have people moving around and getting close to each other some of them getting uh, infected because of that um, and you know going to work go, going to uh, uh, hospital and, and going home and infecting their family and so on so uh, following what is currently the best practice and what is uh, known uh, from, from medical literature. And we can use this to check how different machine learning strategies behave. Now, it's not the real world, but it's, it's a very good way to evaluate whether something fishy might be going on in the machine learning predictor. And then if and when we deploy, I think a lot of effort should be put in constantly monitoring what is going on and, and verifying that uh, the recommendations that are being given, you know, make sense. Um, the model we're going to be, the data that's going to be collected is going to help us verify that the assumptions in the epidemiological model are good and to refine those assumptions to fine tune the parameters of the epidemiological model as we collect more data. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that if you were the government, you would be held to uh, the consequences later by being 
unelected. And if you're a private company, you're, you stand uh, uh, legally liable for the actions yes. you take. So let's, uh, what is the question, let's say in a year, uh, there's a demand to analyze the d data that this uh, system did and the, the, in the influence it had over society. Uh, and then there's a feeling that it didn't do the right thing. Who's responsible? Uh, is it this company and its board of directors bearing the full responsibility for the lives? Is it the entire society because they consented, therefore the consequences are fully on their own shoulders? How do you feel about the fact that the data you will have passing through your system will allow an incredibly powerful uh, lit litigious opportunity uh, for individuals who feel they've been poorly done by? Litigation is uh, something lawyers uh, thrive on. Um, I'll say this, that we, we have already received uh, advice about uh, uh, insurance. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're certainly aware of liability. I'm painfully aware of, uh, of, of where liability can arise. And uh, um, it's among the reasons why we're seeking participation of people like judges uh, in, in overseeing this. Okay. Um, that valid, validation question leads some of our researchers, of course, to ask, uh, so are you keeping any of the data for research? Well, um, yes and no. Let me explain. So the data that would be collected uh, would be like in a vault where <laughs> very few researchers would have access to. And as Richard said, they would have to do it in a very secure way where one of them alone couldn't like go and steal the data. Um, so those would be the people who uh, validate the models, uh, fine tune the hyperparameters and, and, and uh, report about uh, the behavior of the system so that potentially changes in modeling could be done uh, along the way. Um, but part of our machine learning strategy is we have two kinds of uh, models probabilistic models in parallel. We, we have the, the risk predictor that's uh, going to be sitting on the phones. And the risk predictor is trained to be consistent with an epidemiological model. Um, and when we get data from uh, phones, we can also adapt the epidemiological model so that it is consistent with uh, the collected data. So at the end of the day, the epidemiological model is something that is trained on the data. It contains very few parameters because it's like, it's, it's like a, it's, you know, it's the scientific model. It's not like a neural net, right? Um, and that our plan is that this model is, is public domain. It's something that can be shared is an implicit reflection of the kind of data that was, that was acquired. And it's something that can be used for further scientific studies, but doesn't contain any, it's aggregate, right? It's a, like the weights of a, uh, a linear combination. If you want to think about uh, a bunch of these regressors that are anywhere in the uh, epidemiological model. Okay, uh, we are uh, about at our uh, limit uh, in time. And I want to encourage everyone to have a look of, uh, at the website and it's covicanada.org that has more information. Uh, and uh, I understand that governments are considering the use of the app. And I, we heard, what was it yesterday, that uh, the Premier of Ontario uh, thought it would be a good idea for the country to have one app. Um, and a country currently has more than one app. So it's going to be an interesting issue. How is your feeling about uh, deployment adoption and what benefits you can provide with limited uh, uh, adoption or limited deployment and limited endorsement? And how well do you have to succeed to provide benefit? So that's an interesting thing. According to our simulations, you, you need about half the adoption rate using these machine learning based uh, risk assessment compared to the standard binary digital tracing. And so the, the political risk of going with a standard tracing app that you know, other jurisdictions have taken. Uh, Alberta have, uh, have, has one, um, and the uptake hasn't been very high. Um, so the risk would be lower if we if we actually choose something based on machine learning that is going to be useful even with a lower uh, uh, uptake, and even with a lower uptake. In addition to being able to 
uh, uh, slow the spread of the disease, we get those epidemiological models that are incredibly useful for understanding the disease and, and helping public health uh, prevent outbreaks. Okay, great. We're going to have to finish. We will do our best to retain that full set of questions. I believe you've got 27 out of uh, 56 questions answered. That's really great. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, the in video of this entire uh, chat will be online in the uh, Vector YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Um, have a great day.